If dodging rubber balls in gym class was your biggest school worry, count yourself lucky you didn't grow up in 1950s. Can't fail this class. Oh, don't sell yourself short, Mr. Coates. I truly believe that you can. Back then, students had to prepare for the possibility of nuclear war. Okay, people, this may not be a drill. Single file, quickly. The world has transformed over the past seven decades, and thankfully so have schools. Join us as we show you things that were normal in schools 70 years ago. Religious activities in public schools. In the 1950s, public school sponsorship of prayer and Bible reading was astonishingly commonplace across much of the United States. Around 40% of American schools at the time featured some form of organized Christian prayer or scripture reading. This included the familiar Lord's Prayer of Christianity, or selected Bible verses. And in some states, schools were even legally required to conduct such religious observances. New York's Board of Regents mandated that schools begin each day with a generic prayer. It read, Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee, and we beg Thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. Schools could allow students to opt out, but it was the default. Pennsylvania's law went even further, requiring that at least 10 verses from the Holy Bible shall be read without comment at the opening of each public school on each school day. This institutional promotion of religion was challenged by parents who felt it discriminated against minority faiths. The seminal 1962 Supreme Court case Engel v. Vitale ruled that New York's prayer requirement was unconstitutional. While states could not forbid students from voluntarily praying, it decided official sponsorship violated the First Amendment's Establishment Clause, prohibiting a state religion. A year later, school Bible readings were also prohibited for similar reasons. The Supreme Court based its decisions not on the hurt feelings of religious minorities, but on the Constitution. By elevating one faith in public schools, even with opt-outs, states were unlawfully giving preference to one religion in violation of the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. Their role was to educate, not promote faith. With these landmark cases, the justices brought education policy firmly in line with the First Amendment's intent, while no doubt angering many God-fearing Americans at the time. Dunce Caps Today, a teacher placing any sort of hat or degrading costume upon a child would trigger immediate disciplinary action for humiliating a student. But for past generations, schools coercing pupils to don demeaning dunce caps represented customary punishment for misbehaving youngsters. This practice distressingly extended into living memory, with reports of mortifying public shaming persisting through the 1950s in some areas. So-called dunce caps typically comprised paper cone hats, often fitted with an added D branding failure or stupidity. Teachers forced chastise students to sit wearing these markers of idiocy in classroom corners or hallways as examples, sometimes for lengthy periods designed to break willful spirits. The goal involved frightening other youth into dutiful submission by illustrating the daunting consequences of defiance or poor performance. Surviving accounts conflict on how long such mortifying punishments remained locally authorized or common before fading by the 1960s and 70s. But oral histories confirm their lingering usage to scar childhoods perhaps shockingly recent to current sensibilities. Some regions upheld wearing designated shame hats within lifetime memory even among people born after 1960. To moderns, this disciplinary practice manifests astonishing cruelty completely incompatible with human psychological principles governing healthy developmental learning methods. But their schools saw ritual humiliation of I don't think we're gonna get all those numbers off again. <laughs> headstrong youth as appropriate reformatory warnings, illustrating possible very public costs for nonconformity. The divide separating modern student safeguards from recent tradition consequently seems far narrower than commonly presumed. Corporal Punishment in 2023, the very concept of teachers physically punishing students seems outrageous and illegal. But in the 1950s, corporal punishment was considered a wholly appropriate and morbidity means of discipline. Wrapping pupils' hands with rulers, spanking them or making them stand with noses pressed to chalkboards were all customary responses to infractions. Bizarrely, many Americans tolerated such methods well into the 1970s before attitudes shifted. Former 1950s Catholic school students recall Call the sharp sting of a nun's ruler smacking knuckles for such slight transgressions as speaking out of turn. 
Boys at a Jesuit school remember the snap and crack echoing through halls as the priest hit boys' open palms with his infamous paddle. Creative punishments like balancing books on outstretched arms until exhaustion were also employed. And of course, there was the dreaded dunce cap shoved upon problem children's heads. A 1954 Gallup poll found 55% of Americans fully approved of corporal punishment being administered by schools. The vicious cycle of abuse passing between disciplinarian and student seemed normal. Only in later decades did parents start believing they alone should physically punish children. By the early 1970s, after grim tales of beatings, California became the first state to fully outlaw corporal punishment duck and cover drills. Today, duck and cover is a comical slice of Cold War hysteria. But for American school children of that era, the possibility of nuclear annihilation felt terrifyingly real. Duck and cover drills emerged to prepare youth for attack, teaching them to scramble under their desks during bomb explosions or other emergencies. Years before safety stood paramount, Okay, people, this may not be a drill. Single file, quickly. This attempt to mitigate harm showed both naivete and pragmatism. In the 1950s, as U.S.-Soviet tensions escalated, American officials grew anxious that tensions could unleash atomic warfare on the homeland at any moment. To promote self-protection, the government created duck-and-cover educational films and manuals. These instructed students to duck under their sturdy school desks during an attack, then clasp hands behind their necks to shield them from debris. Simple but potentially effective for indirect threats, the drill aimed to minimize exposure rather than survive a direct nuclear blast. Kids were told it could save lives. Critics decried duck and cover as alarmist propaganda designed to terrify youth and rally support for aggressive foreign policies against communism. Catholic peace activist Dorothy Day's 1955 pamphlet, Fear is Now the American Way of Life, accused leaders of deliberately manipulating a climate of dread in schools and society to expand political influence. Whether for good or for ill, staging attack drills communicated that nobody felt truly safe from a potential nuclear holocaust. Although the efficacy remains debated, duck and cover exemplified that leaders were grappling to safeguard youth amidst spiraling global tensions seemingly beyond control. That raising an entire generation under the pall of instant atomic destruction was considered judicious at the time seems both prudent and a product of Cold War madness. But it showed the government prioritizing student safety the best way it knew how against unknowable threats. Racial segregation. It seems unimaginable today, but as late as the 1950s, racial segregation in public institutions, including schools, remained legally protected in many states under the infamous separate but equal constitutional doctrine. This meant that black and white students attended separate schools, and separate usually proved to be wildly unequal and underfunded in reality. Under the doctrine established by 1896's Plessy v. Ferguson Supreme Court case, separating pupils by race was permissible under the Equal Protection Clause so long as facilities were substantively equal. This enabled Southern states to deny black students access to white neighborhood schools, justifying inferior alternatives elsewhere. Black students might be consigned to dismally substandard hand-me-down textbooks and supplies deemed no longer good enough for white students. Segregated black schools, especially in rural areas, were typically small and wretchedly appointed. Many held classes in crude, one-room schoolhouses without proper heating, modern desks, or adequate learning materials. By condemning black children to subpar education, separate but equal trapped most in cycles of poverty and oppression. It also engendered lifelong humiliation and feelings of inferiority. The Kansas case of Brown v. Board of Education successfully challenged the racist practice, arguing that segregated institutions were inherently unequal. In 1954, the Supreme Court unanimously concurred, overturning racial segregation in schools as unconstitutional. If African Americans lived and paid taxes in a particular district, they were entitled to equal access to its schools. This monumental ruling marked a pivotal milestone in the long civil rights struggle toward equality. While the Brown decision initially faced massive local resistance, especially across the South, it ultimately prevailed as a legal precedent thanks to federal government backing. Its success paved the way for additional legislation like the 1964 Civil Rights Act, combating racist policies across other major societal domains. But in countless towns into the 1950s, institutional discrimination posing as separate but equal represented official educational policy with the court's blessing. 
Its legacy still impacts disadvantaged communities today. Thought Police. In 2023, few organizations invite litigation faster than dragging employees' personal political views into hiring or staff management decisions. For obvious reasons, discriminating over First Amendment protected beliefs is illegal, regardless of their offense to prevailing values. Companies typically avoid asking about partisan preferences altogether. But amid 1950s fears of communist infiltration, teachers endured retaliation for disloyal perspectives in schools and society. The Cold War Red Scare stoked paranoid anxiety that leftist teachers might indoctrinate students with propaganda undermining American values and interests. With CIA and FBI encouragement, school boards in cities like New York and Philadelphia assembled investigative thought police committees to monitor staff, identify communist sympathizers, and dismiss those deemed ideologically dangerous. These sanitation committees asked teachers blunt questions about voting choices and opinions on policy issues like integration they deemed communist adjacent with backing from McCarthyist rhetoric. 36 teachers were suspended indefinitely over perceived left-leaning attitudes despite minimal evidence of actual subversive actions. Livelihoods hung on demonstrating the correct politics. Teachers' unions fiercely resisted these obvious civil liberties violations, quickly realizing even mainstream liberal reformers were being smeared with exaggerated accusations. They formed legal defense funds and published editorials decrying witch hunts chilling open discourse in schools at the hands of paranoia. But in an era likening communism to treason, defending employee expression rights proved exceptionally challenging. Thought police committees epitomized education subjected to ideological filters, where independent thinking became a fireable offense. As late as the 1960s, Texas required teachers to swear they did not believe in just to qualify for paychecks. First Amendment freedoms had questionable standing when budgets and public opinion turned against them. One-room schools. Attending a small, rural, one-room schoolhouse may seem like a quaint slice of old-timey Americana, but for students still studying in such primitive conditions into the 1940s, 1950s, and even beyond, the reality was often a deficient education. While cities centralized public education in larger buildings with age-specific grades, many country kids lagged far behind, trying to learn in tiny, isolated classrooms. One-room schools crammed pupils of all grade levels together to be taught by a single teacher. Students lined the walls by age, with very young children sitting up front and teenagers at the back. The teacher thus had to juggle six to eight grade levels simultaneously. Younger pupils did basic reading and writing tasks, while older ones might be tackling algebra. Everyone working on different topics at different paces. Teachers relied heavily on recitations, pulling students up one by one to demonstrate learned skills while the rest worked independently. Managing so many ages and needs at once, instructors often concentrated on the middle grades to the detriment of students at developmental extremes. A 1946 Atlantic Monthly article noted children received just two years of focused instruction when their age aligned with the class average. The isolated location also severely limited resources. Schools typically had a solitary teacher without even a telephone or secretary. As America urbanized and population shifted, most rural one-room schools had consolidated or closed by mid-century. But lasting into the 1950s and beyond in some poverty-stricken rural locales and segregated communities, the model was outmoded in a modernizing society that expected universal standards. For isolated farm kids and marginalized marginalized groups. These little learning outposts represented systemic neglect of America's educational extremes, precisely the young minds that needed help the most. Priests and nuns. The mid-20th century is remembered as a golden age for Catholic education in America. With religious vocations booming, priests and nuns populated schools as teachers, deans, principals, and priests. Their omnipresence kept costs down thanks to meager living expenses salaries. But declines in clergy numbers through the 1950s ultimately raised expenses and forced growing reliance on lay staff. According to the New York Times, Roman Catholic schools of the 1950s and 60s conjure images of stern nuns tightly regulating behavior and imposing rigid discipline. Whether an imposing mother superior or fresh-faced novice, nuns occupied nearly every non-maintenance role from teachers up to principals. A similar pattern held among male clergy, with parish priests often taking leadership roles on high school faculties when not saying mass. 
This heavy presence of clergy was already fading by the 1950s close, however. America experienced drastic falling numbers of new nuns and priests starting that decade, research shows. Demands of managing modernized parishes occupied more time, leaving scant hours for teaching. At the same time, schools could not function without teachers, forcing administrations to hire more lay people. Unlike nuns and priests tied to subsistence allowances, lay teachers demanded salaries reflecting rising modern living expenses and professional pay standards of the era. Schools' personnel costs climbed in tandem. Alongside overall enrollment declines, these financial strains exponentially increased pressures on institutions. Most Catholic schools today employ minimal, if any, clergy. But the 50s were the last era offering students mass immersion in religious instruction figures. See students admitted to college. Nowadays, students anguish if a rare off day produces any grade lower than an A. Top colleges ruthlessly slice applicant pools using high school transcripts saturated with advanced courses and perfect marks as de facto baseline expectations. Parental and social pressure rises as elite universities constantly raise the bar. But grade A obsession is a relatively recent phenomenon that took off in the 1960s when gentlemen C's previously offered students a comfortable path to higher education. Back in the day, a C carried its classic denotation of average quality work. Bell curve distribution of marks ensured most students earned Cs, not As or Bs. This was considered perfectly adequate for admission to in-state teaching colleges or regional universities. A 2.5 grade point average, allowing one C per A was typical then versus the 3 plus GPAs seen now. Getting into an Ivy League school still required high marks, but state colleges welcomed the mainstream mid-century student, earning C's demonstrating legitimate effort. According to one expert analysis, average GPAs began rising around 1968 because professors deliberately boosted grades to help students avoid the military draft during the Vietnam War escalation. An undergraduate failure could mean deployment to Southeast Asia's battlefields. Once grades no longer carried life or death stakes after Vietnam, admissions competitiveness and tuition costs replaced the draft as incentives for ever-elevating standards. Today's educational arms race demands near perfection, thus contrasts sharply with mid-century flexibility that recognizes students achieving within reasonable expectations. In the 1950s, doing one's best to earn a modest C was worthy of the prize of continued education. Schools sought to educate devoted minds, not cherry-pick brilliance. Paying your way through college Today, the idea of working one's way through college without family support or epic loans seems fantastical. Average tuition now exceeds $35,000 at private schools and $10,000 at public universities. Even with a full-time minimum wage job, chipping away at those figures takes ages. But lower fees coupled with summer and part-time work once made self-funding college practicable for past generations, though women encountered barriers. Back in the 50s, in-state tuition remained affordable at public institutions, thanks to generous state subsidies. The GI Bill also gave veterans full-ride scholarships for serving. According to official statistics, the 1949-50 school year saw average public university tuition pegged at $600 annually for out-of-state students and a mere $180 for in-staters at benchmark flagship campuses. With off-campus living costs then only around $500 per academic year, diligent students could pay their way. Working full-time for $0.75 cents an hour at a minimum wage over summer break yielded $540, enough to cover total costs. Part-time campus jobs handled living expenses during semesters. Ambitious students could thus graduate debt-free through personal effort. However, this pathway involved sacrifice with long hours spent laboring. For women, Early marriages cutting short higher education were also common despite expanding career openings. Overall, though, the promise of self-determined, economically mobile futures free from reliance upon parents underpinned optimism. Unlike today's graduates weighed down by crushing student debt before even entering unstable job markets, frugal 1950s students could seize control of their destinies through grit and determination alone. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. Gender stereotypes were one of the things that were normal in schools 70 years ago. Female students faced many restrictions that seem surprising by today's standards. They were often discouraged from pursuing careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. 
and instead steered towards becoming homemakers, nurses, teachers, or secretaries. Female students had to participate in charm school, which taught etiquette, manners, posture, and grooming to mold them into proper young ladies. In some districts, they were required to take home economics classes focusing on domestic skills like cooking, sewing, budgeting, and childcare. Strict dress codes forbade girls from wearing pants, shorts, or jeans, restricting them to skirts, dresses, and blouses. Looking back, aspects of the 1950s school experience seem unfair and limiting for female students. What are your thoughts on the gender-based differences in education and activities back then versus now? Let us know in the comments. No special education. Today, mainstreaming students with disabilities into regular classrooms is educational dogma thanks to decades of advocacy establishing rights-based legal safeguards. But well into the post-war period, many states denied access outright or shunted those with cognitive conditions or physical disabilities into woefully inadequate specialized institutions. It took reforms in the 1960s and 70s to recognize their equal claims to public education. Well into the 1950s in most areas, children deemed uneducable due to disability or below average capability could be legally excluded from public schools. Parents seeking instruction for a deaf, blind or otherwise disabled child might find the only options were underfunded charity schools lacking resources to properly serve students. Few choices existed, and without legal compulsion, districts invested minimally in special needs offerings catering to small groups they expected little from in life. When allowed into mainstream elementary schools at all in that era, special needs pupils faced extreme neglect. Gambino crime family leader Sammy the Bull Gravano who struggled severely with undiagnosed dyslexia in the 1940s and 50s, told Vice News he felt constantly humiliated. With no concept of learning disorders, teachers derided his reading struggles as mere stupidity instead of offering real assistance. The lack of social support drove many like him toward truancy, crime, or aimless marginal lives instead of harnessing their talents. It was not until President John F. Kennedy prioritized the issue, inspired by his own sister's life story, that American schools began actively accommodating those they had long ignored. The 1960s saw increased state and federal legislation pushing more inclusive special education frameworks. But it remained imperfect, as 1975's historic Education for All Handicapped Children Act codifying accessibility rights attests. For earlier generations, though, systemic exclusion and stigmatization were the harsh reality. Separate Study Tracks Modern K-12 education heavily emphasizes preparation for higher academics, with vocational programs increasingly funded victims of standardized testing pressures, college is treated as the default goal for any promising student regardless of needs or interests. Mid-20th century schools, however, regimented pupils early on traditionalist assumptions that their stations would differ. This division severely constrained options for those on minimized work-track curricula. In the 1950s, students underwent testing and evaluations to determine if they were bound for academia or the labor force. High scorers on benchmarks like intelligence tests got placed in enriched college preparatory coursework, privileging literary analysis, languages, hard science, and math. Those struggling might face basic literacy and arithmetic training aimed at general functionality under the expectation they were destined solely to operate machinery or sell goods after graduation. Vocational tracks featured required welding, woodworking, typing, and home economics electives to impart work-ready skills. But with academics downplayed as unnecessary, the system essentially funneled such teens directly into working-class life or marriage with minimal idea more existed. Although well-intentioned to make all youth employable, sorting them young, severely limited personal growth for an entire segment written off as undeserving of deeper intellectual engagement. And with most minority and working-class students slotted as bound straight for jobs, it ultimately reinforced notions they lacked potential beyond laboring. By the 1970s, this restrictive bifurcation faded in favor of modern unified college for all academic models. But through the 1950s, vocational tracking carried the force of assumed inevitability for youth, placed according to prejudices they had no power to defy. Low school enrollment. From today's vantage point where education through high school is both universal and compulsory, 
It may be surprising to realize just how recently historical barriers restricted many Americans from attending formal school at all. However, according to federal statistics, in 1900 just 51% of children aged 5 to 19 were enrolled in any educational institutions. By 1940 that proportion had only risen to 75% in an era when millions secured no scholastic experience. Myriad factors accounted for low attendance, but the necessity of child labor was most pivotal. Whether employed assisting family enterprises or working for companies, economic realities privileged income over schooling for countless youth nationwide. School schedules were often adjusted to accommodate part-day work shifts rather than prioritizing academics alone. Attendance or dropout laws pressuring youths to choose education simply did not widely exist when family financial survival outweighed other youth opportunities. Urban and wealthier children generally enjoyed enhanced enrollment options compared with rural peers. However, around 1900, statistics revealed a concerning trend. Only one out of every nine individuals aged 14 to 17 attended high school. By 1920, that figure had barely budged to 13%, meaning 87% never progressed beyond elementary grades. According to federal data, it was not until the 1940 birth cohort reached their late teens that high school graduation exceeded 50% nationally for the first time. Driven by education reform campaigns, child labor crackdowns, and expanding compulsory attendance requirements, 20th century enrollment patterns underwent momentous transformations abolishing the historical norm of terminated schooling for masses of children by their early teens. But as of the 1950s, curriculum expansions enabling modern universal secondary schooling remained works in progress for administrations realizing education's indispensable role in macro-societal advancement. Short School Year American education nowadays operates on strictly regimented agendas with most schools meeting 180 days annually for a commonly prescribed 6.5-hour day. Relative consistency across regions reinforces cultural assumptions that such uniformity has always defined childhood routines. In actuality, though, early 20th century schools operated far fewer days and hours with calendars bowing to harvest cycles, especially in rural locales where child labor filled vital economic roles. According to official national statistics, the average American school year lasted just 151 instructional days in 1905. Poverty further shortened this window in many districts lacking resources to finance operations for additional weeks when tax revenues lagged behind growing urban systems. Rural schools in agricultural regions regularly dismissed altogether during spring planting and fall harvests so children could assist their families. The average child attended even fewer days than schools hosted due to regular absences. Government studies from the era conclude the typical student sat in class just 106 days per annum, a mere 58% of total available days on outdated schedules. Authorized absences allowing farm youth to participate in agricultural production were largely responsible for glaring attendance gaps. By the mid-century, pressure to extend academic years for child development reasons helped standardize calendars nationally to around 175 days. But it was not until the 1980s that 180, seven-hour days became the enforced norm. Mandatory attendance plus vanishing agricultural roles eased transitional tensions. But through the 1950s, family sustenance requirements frequently trumped classroom obligations, especially when growing seasons dictated community rhythms. Achieving modern consistency waited until work patterns stabilized around urban life. Strict Dress Codes Given how much time is spent today debating appropriate standards of dress in schools, it may surprise some to learn how stringent and restrictive the rules were in the 1950s. Contemporary fashion trends were heavily regulated then to project propriety and discipline students perceived as needing moral guidance. Rebellious styles might undermine the dignity of youth and education, officials believed, necessitating conservative norms denying individualism. For girls, then popular midriff-bearing tops, Clingy sweaters, pedal pushers, and shorter skirts had no place in 1950s classrooms. Hemlines were required to extend demurely below the knee without exception, lest they invite distraction. Blouses had to eschew anything remotely low-cut as well. 
Catholic schools might measure uniform skirt length precisely to prevent creeping above the mandated position. Violators faced disciplinary consequences, potentially including humiliation and corral punishment. Strict standards also apply to boys' clothing and hairstyles in many districts. Leather jackets carried implications of delinquency and gang affiliations, earning bans in various regions. Schools sometimes prohibited boys from donning any outerwear indoors altogether. Super short or excessively long haircuts were forbidden too. Administrators expected male students to wear neatly pressed slacks and collared shirts, projecting upright virtue and respectability. Defenders argued such exacting sartorial codes improved classroom discipline and the broader learning environment. More revealing fashions could presumably undermine girls' safety and provoke misbehavior. Of course, by today's reasoning, this wrongly puts responsibility for controlling male actions on female victims. It also patronizingly assumes improper dress inherently correlates with poor conduct or performance. In reality, as the 1960s counterculture revolution testified via miniskirts and hippies, external appearance reveals little about inner character or academic capabilities. But it took years following the 1950s before schools adopted more flexible, egalitarian dress codes, accepting a far wider range of self-expression. Strict rules have relaxed significantly from the button-down approach, intent on making youth presentations conform to administrators' platonic ideals. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.